welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and today I have, well, let me just put it this way. When I found out I had the opportunity to interview this fine gentleman, I could not say yes fast enough. And then digging into his history, I could easily do a 42-hour documentary on this man and still feel like I have not scraped the surface of his life. His new documentary comes out. It is called David Barber and the William Shakespeare's and William Shakespeare's Last Word on the Murder of JFK. With me today John is Barber. John Barber. John, how are you? I'm just, it's not David, it's John. Oh my God. You know what? That's, that's, hey, that's all right. Hey, that's all right. I do this stuff all the time. I hey, listen, this. my best friend was Red Fox and he often called me Bob, okay? <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> I, so. live, I live very close to his, uh, his old house. On Rawhide. Yeah. Red Fox was my mentor as a comedian from the day I started. Mm -hmm. So we can get into that as we go along. Sadly, like uh, um, the kid that just died. Who is that kid from Friends? Matthew Perry. Oh, Matthew Perry, yeah. I was the best best friends with his father, John Perry, who was a good actor. And... Uh, um, Bo Swenson, does the name Bo Swenson mean anything to you? No. Bo Swenson was this great Swedish American actor who did the first Walking Tall. He was in uh, Waldo uh, Salt, starred in uh, that film. And <clears throat> the three of us started the uh, celebrity hockey team, which is still going strong mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. And he tried everything to help his young son, Matthew, become an actor. And his uh, son was a screw up when he was a teenager and more of a screw up when he became wealthy. And uh, sadly, uh, like uh, Red, success went to his nose and the purpose in his life went to his crotch. And so I have, I have absolutely no empathy for anybody like that. Yeah. Because to be, become successful, this is by far the toughest business in the world to become a success at, to become famous in. It is just cutthroat, unbelievably, devastatingly hard, even though some of the most magnificent people I have ever met are in this godforsaken, magnificent business which no longer exists anymore in America, by the way. Yeah, I um, I find it interesting thinking about guys like Red Fox and, and shows like uh, Sanford and Son, The Jeffersons, Archie Bunker, the kind of things that that they covered in, in way of topic and the kind of things that they would say in way of dialogue really fascinates me because it seems like we should be in a more liberal, liberal and honest time now, but you could not put a show like that on the air today. You're absolutely right. You couldn't put it on. I, listen, I, be, I believe that I lived through the golden times of movies and television and politics, especially since for the three years, the three limited years that, that John F. Kennedy was alive. And, you know, I am just so delighted and tickled that I'm talking to somebody who does a show in Las Vegas. That's because, right. Yeah, because 17 years ago, when I left Canada, I was born in the Salvation Army Charity Ward in Toronto, Canada, to two parents who did not want me. I came from a severely dysfunctional family long before it was popular. And my father fought so brutally with my mother, he thought I'd be better off fighting the damn Germans. So in 39, he joined the Canadian Army, went to fight the Germans lost half a stomach, won the order of the British Empire, and uh, ended up never coming home again and becoming one of the most successful advertising agencies in Scotland. And in 1960, I conclude my third film, which is called John Barber's and William Shakespeare's Last Word on the Murder of JFK. I conclude movie and you see why i mentioned shakespeare by tracking down my father and it didn't look as though it was going to work out he was a lousy father to begin with so he gave me a hundred pounds to go back to my boarding room. i was 20 years of age at the time back to my boarding room in london 
And on the train, I read in the newspaper, the Castle Theater in Farnham, Surrey is looking for actors. So I become one and I'm there for a year. And guess <laughs> what I end up doing? I end up doing Hamlet. So and any and Hamlet happened to be Jim Garrison's favorite. You know who Jim Garrison is, of course. Of course. And and to uh, give our audience uh, a bit of a, a hint, if you've seen Oliver Stone's film JFK, Jim Garrison was played by Kevin Costner. He was the attorney. He was the one that did not settle for anything that was being told at that time. Well, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely right. But I was the only one to whom Jim Garrison would tell his real story. He chose me over Oliver Stone to be the Boswell to tell his story. Now, I get to that when I get to the business of how come I end up in Las Vegas. Uh, from the ages of about 13 to 16, I am just this inveterate bad kid constantly getting in trouble. And I spent half of my time in a movie theater and I fell in America watching Mr. Smith Goes to Washington with Gary Cooper, okay? Great Frank, film. Cap Frank Capra movies, okay? And then as a Canadian, I was in a hockey rink. As a thief, I was in jail a lot. And right across from the jail was the library. And I read a lot. So I was out of my own when I was six years of age. And losing all of this money, I thought to myself, you know, I'm not here to make money. I am here to make friends, but I don't want to be friends with people like this. So when I get this, I go back into the library after getting out of jail again, and I remember these two books, Scarney on Dice and Scarney on Cards, mm -hmm. and I memorized them. Mm -hmm. So I decide, you know what? I want to be a professional gambler and I'm going to go to Las Vegas. <laughs> it is the Mecca. It is the Vatican. Okay. And at that time, there were only about 25,000 people living here. Yeah. yeah. It was like 1950. So anyway, I, I got to show you something. I think there's 25,000 people that live on my block. <laughs> that, that's true. See this book? Uh-huh. Others Not a Virgin, The Bumpy Life and Times and the Canadian Dropout who changed the face of American television. This is the old flamingo of Bugsy Siegel's hotel. Mm -hmm. This is the $600 suit. Wow. I, I won $700 from these guys because I realized I didn't have to be the first one in all the time and the last one to all, always leave. So I win $700 and I thought, I'm going to the United States. So I buy that. That's all I have. And I go to Niagara Falls and I walk across the bridge. Immigration asked me on the other side, where are you going? And I said, I, I'm from the Canadian side and I'd like to see the American side. And they let me in. And I go hop on a train and I have my ticket to Las Vegas. Oh, nice. however, however, in northern Nevada, there's some kind of accident uh, half a mile in front of where the train is. Now, since I'm a runaway from the RCMP, um, I think that they've told the train, hey, stop that thing. we got to get Johnny Barber off. Okay. <laughs> so I jump off the train. And the only place I can get to is Lake Tahoe. Never heard of it. I get on the bus. I go to Lake Tahoe. And it stops in front of the Calneva Lodge. Oh, my God. I go inside. And it's like being at an MGM musical set. Where's Judy Garland and where's Mickey Rooney? And everybody's dressed so beautifully. Yeah. And so I put on the hat because I want people to think I have some cattle, you know, that I am old enough to be standing at the crab table. And people start looking at me. And I think, oh, my God, they must know I'm underage. They're going to call the law. Then pretty soon people at the bar are turning around and looking my way, but not at me, but past me, I turn around and coming through the glass doors, Frank Sinatra, arm in arm with Sam Giancana. Wow. Coffee a chieftain from Chicago. Mm -hmm. Sinatra has a black raincoat over him like an Italian Superman. There are three Italian Praetorian guards. The whole room gets quiet. Now, how would a 17-year-old know that Sam Giancana 
Well, it was on the front page of the paper that I left on the train. And just a week before that, I saw him in a movie called Till the Clouds Roll By. Do you remember that film? I it's, haven't seen it, but I know the title. Yeah, it's the Jerome Kern story. And you might remember the last scene in the film is Sinatra standing on a white pedestal in a white tuxedo singing Old Man River. Mm -hmm. Now he's gotten down from this pedestal and he's walking right past me. Everybody stopped. And 25 years later, I became his private writer because he loved the jokes that I wrote as a film critic. And he loved the jokes that I wrote during the revival of a lot of it. So that's the first time I saw Sinatra. Uh -huh. And isn't it sort of serendipity that after all these years, a few, few years ago, I decided to retire and come up here to live in Las Vegas? It is. It is. It's just, just amazing. I could tell you one cute story if you want to know. Sure. I'll just say that the closest that I come to that experience is the first time I went to the uh, the NAMM show in Anaheim, which is the musical instrument merchandising, uh, you know, the, the big event they have there every year. And the very first year that I went, I think I was there for about an hour and I was downstairs where they have all the like the newbies and the smaller vendors and stuff. And I hear all this commotion and I turn around and just as I'm turning around, Stevie Wonder is walking by me. Oh, my God. And let me tell you, that man, I, I would imagine Sinatra was very much this way, is just, he's a presence. You know, it's the energy in the room changes. But between him and I was his refrigerator-sized bodyguard. <laughs> so, uh, big yeah, big fella. But it was it was very, uh, it was surreal because it was, for, for one, it was unexpected. But just having somebody of that notoriety and that has made such an impact on the industry it was. It really took me back a bit. Well, you know the funny thing you meant. You mentioned what was it, uh, Jackson? Jackson, you just uh, Jackson, you just mentioned right? Stevie Wonder. Oh, oh, I, oh my God! I thought you were throwing away my phone. Um, Stevie Wonder. Well, Jackson had the same in impact. Uh, uh, God, what was it? Gee, why would I not remember his name? That kid. Jackson Five. Who was Oh Michael Jackson? Oh Michael Jackson. When I was a critic, he used to call my house all the time to talk about the reviews that I did. Wow. But they, they were an elective presence, and Frank Sinatra's bodyguard was his best friend, and that was Jilly. They were wow. absolutely inseparable. But mm -hmm. he was a better friend to him than his wife or anybody else. And when Jilly died, he got hit. In Palm Springs, he was in a Jaguar and he couldn't get the doors unlocked. For some reason, he burned to death. Oh. Just a horrible, horrible death. But I, yeah. I could tell you this one cute story about the first time I'm deported. When I get to life. <laughs> the when, first time you're deported. <laughs> yeah, I was deported <laughs> twice. Okay. So anyway, um, it's a real interesting and amazing rag, rags to bridges story. You know, a lot of people read my book, think, Oh, John, how sad that you had such horrible examples for parents. And I said, no, I had the best examples in the world. And they said, well, how could you? They were just womanizers and they were boozers and they were fornicators. How could you? Exactly. I said, I said, listen, I looked at them and I said, they are two human beings that I don't want to be like. And I never became like one of them. So they're better examples. Okay. So anyway, I'm I'm uh, I'm at, at the Calneva Lodge. My game was single deck blackjack. Uh, now it's all multiple decks. But yeah. then, and I was, and you can only gamble a couple of hours a day. Really? You just, well, you can. Well, you can't sit around all day. Oh, it's, oh, right. It's boring. And if you make, let's say, you want to make a hundred dollars for the day, make a hundred dollars and go away. But there was only one movie theater in town, which I went to. But in those days, they had the most amazing act. I went to see Joe E. Lewis, that magnificent comic, opening for Lily St. Cyr. I wow. saw Edith Piaf. You know who Edith Oh, yeah. Piaf? 
the great French chateuse who was singer who was only five feet tall and her voice could fill the Vatican for God's sake and Noel Coward, all these magnificent acts in the main room and acts like Don Rickles were not good enough to get in the main room. They were in the lounge, Keely yeah. Smith and you know, Hank Peter, and that's all gone in America. I mean, when I came here, you could drive down the strip and you would see billboards mm -hmm. that say Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Elvis Presley, Keely Smith. Uh, oh my God, everybody, Jim Neighbors, every star you could think of. Now, in 2023, you go down the star and you only see two bulletin boards on the on uh, uh, the the Miracle Mile. Mm -hmm. And they are chefs that you never heard of and erectile dysfunction. Right. And, and, and if you've been injured in a hotel, call uh, this that, attorney. Yeah, yeah learning, uh, an attorney. So that's yeah. third. It is totally, not only is un -Vegas, Vegas, unlike Vegas used to magnificently be, so is the country since the murder of John Kennedy. Yes. Which is so that now this brings to me uh, uh, my first deportation. So I am making money and making a living, but I am so miserable. It's like Matthew Perry said, even though he made millions and millions of dollars, the misery never messed, met, left his life. Mm -hmm. That's real bad. Well, I think I think there's a, a strange public perception that money will solve our problems, that it'll make us happy. But money can do a certain amount of things that will make our quality of life better. But money doesn't make you fulfilled. Money doesn't make you feel like you have a purpose. And you seem to me to be the kind of person that needs a purpose. That was why I quit gambling. You know what Jim Carrey said two years ago? He said, I wish everybody could become as rich and famous as I am and realize it doesn't mean anything without a purpose. Jim yeah. Carrey said that. So, mm -hmm. so in any way, I, I came to the conclusion that I was having an out-of-body experience just gambling. I, and I was really good at it, especially blackjack. And so one day I just got up and went in, cashed in my chips. I have never gambled again. And I thought, what do I love most? I loved going to see these shows. And next to that, I loved seeing at the end of movies made in Hollywood. Well, I'm too young to be a performer. I don't know what it is I want to do. Maybe an actor. The only place I can do that is Hollywood. So I go to Hollywood. And I end up in a boarding house at La Brea and Hollywood Boulevard. And there are eight males there. And there's a wonderful uh, uh, lady who does the cooking and who owns the place. But there, you wouldn't remember this, I think, you're young. And it was shocking to me, but they had this horrible rise of unconstitutional, undemocratic, anti-free press, McCarthyism rearing its ugly head. And they were finding commies under every bed and by every typewriter in Hollywood. And I, it, it was beyond me because I just got, I couldn't understand it. But one of the people that was in the, uh, the, the group, we'd all gather around the evening table, great meals, great conversations, but they were all political. And so I should just listen to them to for a while. But there's this 28 year old kid who was always hammering Roosevelt. How about what a commie was? Everybody was a commie. He said, you know, God crippled him because he's a commie. And wow. the, reason he did, the reason he didn't blind him is because he wanted him to wake up to his ugly wife, Eleanor. I mean, he was really, really brutal. And in his lapel, he had this thing that said, better dead than red. Well, I got so tired of hearing about it. I said, how can you? Say that, put that stupid thing in your in your lapel. He says, first of all, kid, I'm 17. I am not stupid. I am a young Republican. 
And I say, well, you're the only young Republican in America because all of them are over 60 or 70. <laughs> well, everybody applauded me, okay? And I didn't know where it came from. So he just, he hated the fact that I said that. And then I said, and by the way, it doesn't matter what color you are. If you're still above ground, you can change what you don't like. That's right. But if you're in the gray, better dead than red, you're just feeding the worms, okay? Mm -hmm. He didn't like me hearing that. And I said, listen, I don't know much about American politics or anything, but I do know this. I'm somebody who wants to be an actor. And what I do know from what I learned in the little news I listened to in Canada was that the one who caused the depression in this country was not Roosevelt. It was a Republican named Hoover. And I said, no, I go out every day and I see Roosevelt Golf Course and I see Roosevelt Hospital. I see Roosevelt High School, Roosevelt Boulevard. And all they ever named after Hoover was a goddamn vacuum cleaner. Well, now everybody's <laughs> cheering me. He jumps up and runs upstairs. Now get this, how instinctive I am. I knew he was calling the FBI. And so I jumped up and I ran into my second floor uh, little room. I stared open the window and climbed out to jump down. And there are three FBI cars down below. And wow. they all jump out in their blue suits and hold it, Mr. Barber, stay where you are. They knew who I was, obviously. Wow. So they come in and they're very polite. They ask to see my visa. And I said, what well, don't have the visa? And they say, well, how did you get into the country? I said, I walked across at Niagara Falls and I told the immigration officer I was there to see the other side of the falls. And then he said, well, how long do you tell him you were going to stay? I said, I said, I was going to tell him I was going to stay one day. Mr. Barber, how many days ago was that? It was 365 days ago. I said, <laughs> well, he started to howl. I said, okay, you're coming with me. We're going downtown. So they fingerprint me and they all gather around to hear this Canadian saying, ooh, nabo, nay, and whatever, how Canadians talk. And they find out that I'm, they're talking, about, well, this guy's no threat to the government, but he is a threat to some merchandisers and shops back in Toronto. So we'll turn him over to the immigration service. So they turned me over to the immigration service. And they put me in a place called Terminal Island in San Diego. Mm -hmm. It looked like Mira Lago, for God's sake. It would look like a resort. And none of the cops is armed because we're just, you know, we weren't dangerous criminals. We just, right. and they wouldn't deport me right away because they don't want to spend money on one airplane. What they do is they say they wait for, a dozen more Canadian geese, that's what they call this, and force us to fly north, and then they charter a cheap plane and send us back. Well, I didn't want to hang around. I said, is there any way I could get out of here other than waiting for more Canadian? And they said, if you have $19, you can buy a bus ticket to Toronto. We'll give you a voluntary departure. I had deleted my mother. Because I loathed my mother. I did not want to call her. But I thought maybe if she gave me $19. And it pained me. I had to call collect. I didn't think she would answer when she heard the operator say, would you collect, take a collect call from John Barber? And she said, yes. And I told her that where I was, I was going to be deported, but I could be saved if she sent me $19. And she started cussing at me. You son of a bitch. You're just like your goddamn bastard of a husband. You deserve to be in jail the rest of your damn life. She hung up. And that's the only wow. reason she took the call. Well, I'm in the third floor. And the third floor has about 45 cots, all occupied by Hispanics and Chicanos and Mexicans. The guy next to me, Jose, is the guy that once a week takes all the dirty laundry, the pillows and the coverings and everything, and puts them in a large basket 
puts him down a chute down three floors to get clean. Well, I do not speak Spanish and I don't, he doesn't speak English, but I pan him on him a lot because I was a huge fan of the old Sid Caesar show. Oh, and sure. They, they did a lot of pantomiming and I would pan him and they would gather around me and laugh at what I was trying to do. Well, finally, he realized that what I wanted him to do was put me in the bottom of that bucket and dump me down the uh, to the uh, the floor to the ceiling. Did you fit in the chute? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the chute is about this big, and it's a big basket. It's because it has to hold all the laundry from the oh, all okay. these beds. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's piled up. And what it is that he did? He had a friend of his pretend to faint in the hallway. And that distracted the guards, and he lifted up the junk, put me at the bottom. God, did it stink. And he put it on top of me, and he opened the chute, and down I went. Now, here's this agnostic praying to God that their dirty clothes at the bottom, or I'm going to break a lot of bones. Yeah. But I land on this 10-foot pile of trashy, smelly clothes. Now, what I had done, I had cased the place so carefully that I realized on the busiest day, which was a Wednesday, I could walk the 50 yards to the bus stop entrance, or I could go to the 25 or 30 yards out the door that led to the ocean where I could swim to the nearest boat, which is only like 25 yards away. So I was really happy. So I hit and I jumped up right away and I run to the door to the bus stop. It's locked. Holy God, it's locked. Then I run to the other one. It's locked. And I went back and forth and I'm tired. And how can it be locked? How can it be locked? I got so tired and exhausted. I sat down on the dirty laundry and fell asleep. Then a body is shaking me. Oh my God, what do we got here? We got a live body came down that chute in these dirty clothes. Who is this? What's your name? And I said, John Barber, sir. He said, well, John Barber, what is it you're doing in all these dirty clothes? And I said, trying to escape. What else? <laughs> he didn't know whether to laugh or not. He said, well, what else is coming your way? So he took me up to the office. They spent an hour grilling me, three of them, to find out if I had accomplices. And of course, I didn't rap. I said, I don't speak Spanish, okay? They don't speak English. So when they brought me back in, all three guards brought me back in and the door opened. Every single Hispanic was standing and watching to see if I had ratted. And they had realized I had not ratted because I put my thumbs up, okay? Mm. And so I, before he put me in my cot or led me to my cot, I turned around. I very loudly say, and everybody's listening. Now it seems they understand English. I said, hey, it's Wednesday. How come all these doors are locked? And the guy says, you idiot, it's July 4th. It's America's holiday. Oh. <laughs> and from that day on, all the, and they screamed. They started calling me Julio Cuatro. But the upbeat to the story is, Exactly 30 years to that day, I get a letter. And it's a well-written letter. And this guy is writing and saying, Dear Mr. Barber, you have to tell me this. I am telling my children and my friends and my mother and father and my grandmother and grandfather and all my neighbors, you are the guy that I picked out of that dirty laundry. Okay, now you have to please tell me. It's, I know it's you. I'd never forget that voice, let alone the face. So I sent him back this picture, and it was 8 by 10 glossy of me now in a $1,000 suit with uh, Sarah Purcell's arms around me like she's kissing me. Okay, Lovely Sarah right. Purcell. Yeah. yeah, Sarah Purcell. And I say, I'm so glad you wrote because I've been looking for you for years. Because had you not found me, I would either be in jail or in the merchant marines. <laughs> so that ended wow. Up. One one thing I really love though is that you 
did not say life dealt me a shitty hand and that's why I'm not a good person. That's why I haven't made anything out of myself. You decided, I don't want to be like these people and I'm going to do something better. And you did it. I mean, you created television shows, you're a stand-up comedian, you've done all these things and we haven't even gotten to JFK yet. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, that, I love that though. Well, the, the, one of the lines that I wrote, you know, is I take the shit that was dealt to me and turn it into funny fertilizer. Yeah. And and you know, look at the funniest, the funniest, if, if you're talking about ethnic groups, the funniest groups are first the Jews. I mean, look what they had to go through. And fun to some of the funniest comedians in American history were Jews. True. And Jackie Mason on my first on the first pilot of Real People, which I was going to do at ABC. Jackie Mason was going to be my consumer advocate. Oh, no kidding. Yes. And Jackie Mason is one of the few meetings I knew who never bombed. And also, when I had it at ABC, uh, my Byron Allen was going to be Richard Pryor. So hopefully wow. we'll get to these uh, these stories. But uh, the the reason I became a comic the second greatest writer in America was Mark Twain. And Mark Twain said the two greatest days in your life are the day you're born and the day you discover why. Hmm. That's brilliant. And the yep. day I discovered why was the day I discovered Jack Parr. Hmm. He, because he was by far the greatest late night talk show host in history, the funniest, the most intelligent the most charming, even though Steve Allen was good, you could bundle them all together. They don't come close to Jack Parr. I and I, and I, I, I thought he has conversations with people. I thought people cussed one another, threw beer cans at one another, but he opened his show with a comedy monologue. And I remember one of his first jokes. Well, I was about 25. I remember all this. I don't, you know what? I do. I tell nothing at the uh, but the truth. And Mark Twain said, "If if you tell only the truth, never you uh, you will uh, you, you never you had you, you have, have to have a good memory. You have to have a good memory. You never have right. to have a good memory. Mm -hmm. You just tell the truth." And so that's what I did. So a lot of examples like that. So and anyway, when I decided I would become a comic, I thought. Well, I should get all the albums of those people who were successful, Bob Mohar, Shelley Berman, Mort Saul, Jonathan Winters, all of them. Oh, my God. They were just all of them. They were brilliant. They were original. They had their own style and they had a personality. But I had no personality, none whatsoever. <laughs> I, I would know? suspect that wasn't really the case. <laughs> you know, it was, I, you know, Henny Youngman, you know. Take my wife, please. please I think right? Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a personality. I'm not like that. So I did not have a personality. And then I thought, well, what I should do, I'll get the joke book. And I got a dozen joke books from the library. And the three or four jokes that were funny, everybody on the planet knew. And I said, you know, I can do better than that. And I had never written a joke. And in five minutes, I sat down. And I wrote an unbelievable five minutes. And a week later, I was working with Jim Neighbors at a club mm -hmm. called The Horn in Los Angeles, became one of Jim's best friends at the time. And this is how simple my material was, because it was a time of all this black power stuff going on and you know, voting, uh, uh, denying votes to uh, colored people and stuff like that. And my opening line was, hi, my name's John Barber, and I'm appearing here through the courtesy of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Canadian People. So that's how corny cool that line was. And then, you know, my mother was Jewish and my father was Scotch, which proves you can mix anything with Scotch. And uh, I had a real trouble at synagogue because I was the only kid with a plaid skull cap. 
and you don't have no idea how tough it is playing hot and the gill on the bagpipes. Okay. So I became really successful. Sure. And, you found your you found your way, yeah. Yeah. And but yet my first album was nothing like that. I got my first album as a revolt result of listening to the most hilarious thing I have ever heard on television. I have I only told it on a record. I have never, I've been interviewed 25 times up until today. I have never told this story about why my first album in 1966 was called It's Tough to Be White, even though Red Fox was my closest friend. That's and a great I, title, though. I love it, that. It, and Yeah. And it the material, which you can listen to on my website, www jobarbersworld.com is funnier today because it's more forbidden today than it was then. Even I, though I think America's greatest comic was Bill Hicks, even yeah. better than Lenny Bruce. I spent the last week of Lenny's life with him. It's a magnificent story in the book. Oh my God. But in, in any event, um, how it came about, I was watching television. And the show was David Susskind. Do you remember David Susskind? Don't think I'm familiar with him. It, it was a show called Open End. Okay. And uh, in America, when I first came here in the 50s, there were 50 Americans of all stripes that I could admire. And they could be right wing or left wing, or they could be religious or non-religious. But they were all articulate, all intelligent all people that you could admire. There is not one person like that in America today. There is not one hero in America today. You look at Julian Assange, okay? He finds out and reports to us all the war crimes, actual war crimes, the United States and the CIA and the military are committing. Mm -hmm. That according to Nuremberg, our war crimes, he has to flee the country. And then uh, Ed uh, Ed Norton, is, was that his name? The mm -hmm. guy from the CIA who uh, uh, ran away from America. He was with the CIA. Mm -hmm. And he reported how we are being reduced to numbers in this country. That we are re being reduced to just consumers. And they so maligned him, he had to rush to the Soviet Union for mm -hmm. refuge. And yet, at the time of the Pentagon Papers, when they were released in the 60s to help stop the Vietnam War, the guy who released the Pentagon Papers became one of America's national heroes. I forget his name offhand, but I mentioned it in the documentary. America has no more heroes. So, but David Susskind, if Jack Parr was funny on the one side, David Susskind not only was the intellectual on the other side, he was one of the greatest producers of television in America. He got the rights to do redo all of MGM's music, uh, movies as television. You, if you Google them, believe me, you will, you will somehow remember. If not, any of your friends who were a little older will remember David Susskind. Mm -hmm. Anyway, one day he has this uh, black guy on the show. He has this Jewish guy on the show. And both have been convicted uh, erroneously of homicide. Now, the black guy was sentenced to 27 years, and the Jew was sentenced to uh, 12 or 13 years. And the lawyer who was a guest was a guy named Ehrlich. Ehrlich was the most famous libertarian lawyer and liberal lawyer in America. And David Susskind wanted him to be on the show. And uh, Ehrlich, unfortunately, had a problem of being a very serious drinker. So, and it showed during this interview. So, and here's 
this bleeding heart liberal, that's what they used to call David Seskind. And he's talking passionately from his heart. And he's looking at the black guy and he's saying to Lou Ehrlich, uh, it was, actually, it was a black guy who had 12 years. It was a Jew at 27 years. Oh, but he's wow. sympathizing with the black guy. And mm -hmm. he looks at Lou Ehrlich and he said, Lou, how is it possible in America with a constitution and a bill of rights and the rule of law? Nobody above the law was bullshit that doesn't exist anymore. Right. How is it? How is it that this man could be? so illegally sent to prison. And Lou Ehrlich, uh, Ehrlich, Ehrlich uh, his first name wasn't Lou, but his last name was Ehrlich. Ehrlich sort of is like this. He says, well, David, I got to tell you something. The reason that is, I mean, it is very, very obvious because you look at him and look at how black he is. I mean, really black. He's the blackest man I ever saw. And you know, in this country, when they arrest a black man, he doesn't stand a Chinaman's chance. Well, <laughs> holy God, I fell over screaming with laughter, and I was the only one who laughed. It was so ridiculous. So I sat down, and in half an hour, I wrote a 40-minute album. How come it's so tough to be white in America today, sympathizing with the Jew who got like 27 years. Wow. And, and I told Red Fox, and I said, Red, I would like it, but I'm nervous about the title of the album because it's called It's Tough to Be White. And this is what Red said. He said, shit, John, make it, then explain. He was so funny. And the other thing he said brilliantly about Jim Garrison, when Jim Garrison heard this, he laughed and laughed. Because when I met Jim Garrison, if we ever get to it in these stories that I'm telling you, he said that Red Fox said to me, because I thought Jim Garrison was one of the rarest heroes in American history. There's nobody comparable to Jim Garrison. And that's why he's more important than either John Kennedy or even Thomas Jefferson, because he's the only history in history who stood up against the president of the United States, against Congress, against the media, try to prove constitutionally that no American should be above the law. Yet he was shut down. And that's why I've been trying to raise a scholarship fund for Jim at Tulane University ever since I made the first film back in 1992. And the scholarship cost $1 million for five years for any needy student, okay? Mm -hmm. And I came to close to it twice, which we don't want to get to right now because I got to tell you a little more about Red Fox. Are, are we okay on time? Because I know we're over our... Uh... Oh, our God. schedule. I'm I'm good to keep going, but I think you have another one coming up at two, don't you? Yeah, well, I do have another one coming up. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Could you and I do this again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me end uh, on this particular story and uh, why how I lost my uh, I had the two best jobs in the history of television. First real people which was the highest rated, most original show in the history of television. And thank you for that show. I grew up on that show. I absolutely loved it. I watched it every week, even after I didn't know that you got fired from it. Well, you, you looking at you, you can't be that old. Okay? I'm 51. Wow, you must have been a kid watching that one. <laughs> I was, yeah. Okay, so, but in any event, I got fired again trying to tell Jim Garrison's story with this platform. And I lost the morning show in Los Angeles called the AM show, the highest rated morning show in America. Again, trying to book get Jim Garrison on that show after reading his book called Heritage of Stone. Uh, and I will tell you that short sh uh, story briefly, because that's how I, I got the book, uh, name of the title to the book with a conversation with Jim trying to book him on the show. Mm -hmm. And anyway, and then. Two things with Red Fox, two stories I must tell you. Um, when I got my first uh, 
talk show. I was hired by a guy named uh, uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck Reynolds at the Metro Media Station in Los Angeles. And just before that, I was under contract to Westinghouse to replace Merv Griffin as the host of his Westinghouse show. Do you remember Merv's show? Oh, yeah. The second most popular talk show in America. Mm -hmm. And he mistakenly gave it up to go and try to go against Carson on CBS. We absolutely and totally bombed. He should have stayed where he was because he was wonderful. And that's where I started on American television, first on the Art Linklater Talent Scout show, mm -hmm. where I was the only second act ever to be brought back on that show. Wow. So if you Google my site, johnbarbersworld.com, you Google the Talent Scout show, you'll see me performing. You Google Merv Griffin show, you'll see me performing. And if you Google Car uh, uh, Sinatra takes over the Tonight Show, you'll see me performing because I was the first person he asked has to come on and do an act. So wow. in any event, they used my ratings. Uh, a guy named McGannon was the president of Westinghouse. And they used my ratings to get David Frost's money down because McGannon was an Anglophile. And every time he could go to England, David Frost could take him to Buckingham Palace and 10 Downing Street. I could only take him to a jazz club to listen to some music and some of my jokes. So they hire him. But this guy, this guy hires me at Channel 11. And the first thing I want to do is put Red Fox on the air. I meant right. because yeah, it's yeah. funny. And I knew all about what he talked about, Black Bauer and stuff like that. So uh, does he, do you remember the name Jack Carter? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, do you remember the crying comic? Remember oh, that? yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I had two of them on because I wanted to have a show of comics. Mm -hmm. And one of them had to be Red Fox. Oh, sure. Not because he was black, but he was funnier than all of them. Yeah. So anyway, he comes out. And you know what the Scots used to wear when they play golf? These pants that are so rolled up under their knees and the socks come under their knees. And they're called knickers. Mm -hmm. So when I introduced Red... He was coming to Vegas to be Perry Como's opening act, but wow. he never been on television, even though he was going to open for Perry Como. Mm -hmm. And so I introduced him and he walks out and he walks down in front of the audience before he comes to sit down. And he looks at the audience, got that perpetual cigarette in his mouth. And he is saying, ah, it's just down south, you know, and a lot of them guys were just looking at me and staring at me. And some of them started to holler knickers, knickers. So I thought I'd go out and get me a pair like that. You know what the word knickers really meant to the audience. Well, they sure. howl. So anyway, he sits down. And, you know, he was Malcolm X's best friend. Wow, they, I didn't know that. Yeah, they used to rob people. And Dave broke into stores. And, and he tells the greatest stories. These are also on my side. They used to sleep on top of buildings in the winter, for God's sake, uh -huh. before Malcolm changed his name. Wonderful, wonderful story. So anyway, I'm talking to Red. I say to him, uh, Red, um, but what do you think about all this black power stuff? So Red says, well, I don't care about no black power, and I don't care about no white power. I just cares about green power. And I said, what? What is green power? Green power. If you have green power, you can buy the buildings where the whites and blacks holds their meetings. <laughs> and he starts to laugh. So this pops into my head, channeling something. And I, I'm afraid I'm going to embarrass him because nobody can be that quick. And I say to him, Red, why do you think money's colored green? Without missing a beat, he said, oh, that's because Jews pick it before it gets ripe. Holy God. That See, was the, last, the biggest laugh in the history of television. It took us 20 minutes to restore the crowd. And Jack Carter would jump up and pull up money from his wallet, green power, and then we'd all fall down again. 
But yeah. you know, if, if he said that today, if he if he did an act on the Tonight Show today, thirty seconds from them, his career would be over. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It would. No question. It would be over. It's like you mentioning uh, all in the family. Sanford, you know that Sanford's his real name. His real name is John Sanford. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. His father, his brother's name was Fred, who died. So out of respect, he called his character Fred Sanford. Oh, that's interesting. And it's originally a British show called Steptoe and Son. And that's where Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin got it. And when he was arguing what 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 he was getting twenty five thousand dollars a week. Jeez, that's huge for back then. It was massive, but he was upset because they wouldn't give him a window in his basement dressing. And I said, Hey, if you get a window, you only get to look at dirt because you're underground, you <laughs> idiot. You're making twenty five thousand dollars a year. So there was great news when he left the show. He came to our house to stay. Nice. Yes, because he was negotiating with ABC and asked me to help draw up some ideas for shows and things so that he could present a contract to ABC, which he did. And unfortunately, it bombed. And he bombed. I said, stay with York and then Lear. You know, you're going to get residuals forever. And if you don't let that money go to your nose, Red, I was well aware of him. If you don't let it go to your nose, for God's sake, you are going to be a mega millionaire. You are not designed to be a producer. You are only designed to be a comic. So please keep doing that. Willie did the success, unfortunately, like Matthew Perry went to his nose. Yeah. But I do have empathy because I loved the man. He yeah. was so sweet, was so sweet. To me. Please, please tell me when he stayed at your house, you made him stay in the basement. Oh God, that is hilarious. <laughs> no, he stayed. He stayed. I originally had a little bungalow that I lived in in Toluca Lake, and when I was working on Real People, I was making thirty thousand dollars an hour. I was making more than Red Fox. That's amazing, amazing, because we did twenty-two shows a year, and then there were the the reruns. A rerun and it was thirty thousand dollars. So I so what I did, I built this huge chalet. I was just a couple of blocks from Crosby's house, a couple of blocks from Bob Hope's house. And oh my God, it, it was just magnificent. But that's where he he came. And I, my wife, he was more comfortable with my wife than any human being in the world, because my wife has that kind of spiritual presence you could warm her, your hands just being around her see and she'd get on an elevator in the first floor and by the second floor everybody has told her their life story you know now to the um, how i lost uh my morning show well we've uh, got we've got 10 minutes to get to your next meeting do you want to stop here and continue on the next one? Oh well you or know, do you have a minute to tell it yeah i i, I will tell it uh okay. Because I think it's important. At the, in those days, they have what they call the fairness doctrine. Mm -hmm. And uh, 20,000 Chicanos were protesting and marching against ABC in Los Angeles and City Hall and the Board of Education because there's not enough Hispanic rep representation. And a lot of licenses were lost. They, ABC didn't want to lose their license, so they dumped the clown shows and the cartoons. And they wanted a 90-minute news information show, and they held open auditions. And uh, one of the fellows, uh, uh, Mario Machado was his name, the handsomest human being I ever met. And he was, he was Hispanic through and through, spoke five different languages. He was everybody's ethnic. That was my joke about him. I mean, Chinese, uh, Hispanic, Mexican, everything. And the job would have been his. Well, he saw me working out at the Ice House in Pasadena with the young Steve Martin. Wow. And when I came to the lobby, he said, John, I just left ABC. You should go and audition. The producer's name is Brad Lockman. 
they're looking for a guy to host this morning show. You'd be perfect. I said, Mario, no, you'd be perfect. They want replacements for people like you. Yeah. And he said, I'm a great reader, John. And he had the greatest voice like Orson Welles. But you can think on your feet. You can be funny on your feet. You can talk politics. That's what your act is. So I got the job. Wow. And then getting the job, uh, my son was 12 years of age. Uh, and I was so angry. I was 37. Okay. And I just thought, well, it's not Jack Parr at the Tonight Show. But I'm telling you, I was thrilled. And within months, we were the number one morning show in the country. The FCC commissioner, Nicholas Johnson, 35 years of age, the under, youngest FCC commissioner in America, wrote a letter to the president of ABC, Leonard, Leonard Goldenson, said, you have the brightest, smartest young man in America on a local show, and you should make him national. And then he copied me the letter and put a PS and said, geez, John, I may have just cost you your job because I don't think it's smart to be smart in America anymore. <laughs> That's 1970. Imagine what it's like now. So yeah. anyway, I didn't book Mr. Garrison. Uh, like everybody else, and like Mr. Garrison, I believed the government, okay? That they wouldn't lie to us about something like that. Yeah. And uh, one day, I'm in, uh, but I did say, he arrested Clay Shaw in 1967, and the media and the government attacked him as a coup. And I said, well, and they wouldn't get out of his way. And I said, hey, if he's got not nothing, get out of his way and let him fall on his ass. So anyway, I go into Edmund's bookstore on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, across from Musso Frank, I see this book, Heritage of Stone, author Jim Garrison. I read it standing there. And there I find that he has to bring time life to the Supreme Court to get the Zabruder film to show the jury. There's a forensic pathologist named uh, uh, that they call to be a defense witness for Clay Shaw, but on cross-examination, he is his name was Fink, and Fink says there was no autopsy because a general named LeMay, a known hater of John F. Kennedy in public, prevented the autopsy. So I immediately called Garrison. I tell him I've read his book. And he said, oh, you must be the other one. I only sold two copies. And I said, <laughs> and you're like, no, I read it for free standing there. <laughs> yeah. So so any event, I finally talk him into, uh, uh, talk him into coming on, uh, on the show. He said, you know, it's, it's he says, it's strange you call, John. But a week ago, the Harris poll said 82 percent of all Americans do not believe Clay uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did it alone or he had to have an accomplice. And I said, well, numbers that high are, why aren't they storming the barricades of bullshit in Washington and doing something? He said, well, you didn't see the second question. And I said, what was the second question? And he said, the second question, of the survey was, or would you like to see a deeper investigation where the FBI and the CIA are questioned and guess what the ratio or percentage was? And I said, what? 40 or 50 percent? He said 22 percent. What does that tell you about America's cowardice? And I wow. said, well, I don't know what it says about America's cowardice, but I do know what it says about my mother. He chuckled about your mother. I said, I know what my mother did in the rumble seat of the car on the pool table or in the bedroom to conceive me. But don't ever tell me my mother is not a virgin. Well, he howled. How he said, My God, you sound like my se second favorite writer who happens to be Mark Twain. And he said to me, You know what Mark Twain said a hundred years ago about our first fake war? He said, The second real fake war was the Cold War. Russia was no threat, but it was two a hundred years ago when we murdered 200,000 Filipinos. It was, it was Mark Twain who said, if you do not read America's newspapers, you are uninformed. But if you do read them, you're misinformed. And so that's true. So I booked him because he, one of the things he loved to talk about was Shakespeare. 
And a lot of the titles in the book are taken right from Hamlet. And so that's why my movie, The American, John Barber's and William Shakespeare's Last Word on the Murder of Jeff Tate is there. Yeah. And I'm just, I've only shown it to one interviewer. I would be happy to send you a copy for yourself. Be honored to watch yeah. that. I really would. I really wish I could make the premiere. I can't wait to get into this more when we talk again, but I need to make sure that you get to your other interview. I promised Harlan that I would. Oh, oh. But so this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. I can't wait to, to chat with you some more and get into the film and all the other branches of things that went on surrounding JFK's assassination, because there's so much more than just the trial and the trial. Everything that went wrong with America happened on November 22nd, 1963. Everything disappeared. Class, culture, law, it all, you open that Pandora's box, you could restore democracy. And the last word I will say about this is it's strange that you were talking to me today because, to, you know, the uh, Congress, as a result of the movie JFK, passed the uh, Assassinations Record Act. And three years ago in October, they were to release all the files. Right. And they didn't release a one, even though one of them accidentally released is in my second film. And it tells the lawyer, legal department at the CIA to send lawyers to help play Shaw. Otherwise, Jim Garrison is going to win. He had solved the case. No, no question about that. But in any event, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Knight and uh, Donald Trump, when he was president, let the CIA have their way. Biden, three days ago, said, I'm washing my hands of the CIA and the files. They can do with, with it, what they want. They ruled three days ago. They are never releasing to the public the Central Intelligence Agency's files on the murder or the investigation into the murder JFK. Oh, that's that's huge. But we're going to yeah. talk about that next time for sure, because it is two o'clock and I absolutely need to get you to your other interview. But thank you so much. I'm going to call Harlan uh, in just a couple of minutes and get you rebooked. I'm going to book you for 32 hours because I think we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> that's so funny. But it is such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. And I'm so glad you're you know what we'll do after. I'll tell you what I do. We'll do after. I send you uh, the film and maybe when we're chatting later after maybe sometime in the middle of December, mm -hmm. my wife and I will take you to Marciano's. Oh, that's so kind of you. Uh, and we can listen to a lot of Sinatra. Oh, I'd and, love that. Yeah. While, while we eat. So again, serendipity. See all these yeah. wonderful, nice accidents. I love it. Well, you have a great day, my friend. A pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming on. And I cannot wait to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. The cancer <laughs> is mine. Thank you. Enjoy your next interview. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Cheers.